that basically people can hold seemingly um, contradictory beliefs when you change the utility function, right? And the way to explain that is that you, because you have model uncertainty or ambiguity, you tend to, you want to have, say, for example, robust beliefs. So you tend towards worst case scenarios, or if you're a gambler, the opposite, you tend to the positive side. Um, so here's just a very brief example how you can use exactly the same idea about the ambiguous earned um, in order to model cooperation. So um, <clears throat> here on the uh, left, you see the payoff matrix of a, f a famous cooperation game, the stack hunt game. I think that goes even back to Rousseau. And the idea is that there are two people, and they have to decide whether to hunt hare or stag. Now, um, if you hunt the hare, you get a little reward. Um, but the good thing is you can hunt it by yourself. You don't have to rely on the other person. If you hunt the stag, then you get a big reward, but only if both hunt the stag. Right? So if the other person decides not to cooperate with you, then you go to bed hungry, which is very bad. Um, so there's basically two solutions to this game. One is the risk dominant equilibrium that would be to go for the hair, right? Because then there's no risk involved. You know what you get. Or the stag, which is the payoff dominant because you get a lot, but it's a bit risky. Um, and so what we did was that we designed um, a sensory motor game where basically allows you to translate these payoff matrices uh, from classic game theory into like a continuous sense motor decision. And the way it basically works is that you have to move from a start to a target um, and the position, and you can touch the target anywhere, right? But the position that you choose um, basically tells you how much stack and how much uh, hair you're doing, right? And the same for the other player. Now, in this case, the other player was a computer player because we had to repeat um, this many times. Um, and, um, and this thing could change, right? But what you would feel is the force here. And the force tells you the payoff, right? And if the other player changes their position, then you feel a change in the force because that's like them changing the, uh, their choice. Right, um, and the same for you. So basically, you have a dynamically coupled system, right? Um, and we designed this previously for the prisoner's dilemma, where we actually had two people playing against each other, and we saw that people converged to Nash equilibria and so on, without actually knowing the kind of game they're playing, right? They were just uh, feeling the forces and trying to adapt to that somehow. Um, here, we chose to do this with one player because we needed to have full control of the other player, so we chose it to be a computer player. Um, and what did we do? So when you <clears throat> make this decision, whether to cooperate or not, you may rely, well, you have a first uh, a prior belief, right? How likely is it that the other person is going to cooperate with me or not? Um, and you can think about that like as if the other player was an urn with an unknown bias, right? So cooperation is on one side, no cooperation is on the other side, and maybe cooperate some of the time, right? So it's like a probability to cooperate, and you don't know what is the probability to cooperate. So the other player becomes for you the urn. And now you see data, right? What did the other player do in the past? Just like in the example yesterday. And then you update this belief, right? What is the probability that this player is going to cooperate? Now, if you are pessimistic or, say, ambiguity averse, right, then you're going to assume the worst, that the other player is not going to cooperate. If you're optimistic or you like the ambiguity, right, then you're going to think, OK, I don't know this other player, but life is good. Right? The world is my friend. And this other player is part of the world, so it's also my friend. So he's going to cooperate. Right? And, that, and then over time, this ambiguity attitude is washed out the more and more data comes in. Right? Like we saw yesterday. The more data you have, the ambiguity is washed out. But, of course, in this case, this initial 
this initial attitude towards ambiguity has a big effect on what equilibrium you're going to converge to, right? Because if both of you are optimistic, then you're going to end up very likely in a cooperative scenario. If both of you are ambiguity averse, you're very likely going to end up in the non-cooperative scenario, right? And so what we looked at here is um, <clears throat> we looked at the trials, exactly like in the example yesterday, where basically, so at two time points, time point three and time point 11, right? And at time point three, we looked at trials where the computer player cooperated once and did not cooperate once, right? So we were 50-50 chance. And the second time, after 11, is he cooperated five times and did not cooperate five times. So also 50-50. But in the latter case, you know more, just like in the case of the urn, right? And then we looked at what is the probability of the human players, so these were our six human players, to cooperate, right? And then what you see is that even though it was 50-50, so if you just care about the mean, right, again, this shouldn't make any difference. So for example, if you were doing fictitious play, this would be exactly what you do. You just care about the mean. You would predict no difference here. Um, but of course, we see a difference between uh, 3 and 11, right? And we see that in the beginning, most subjects actually were being cooperative in this scenario, right? Even though it was 50-50, thinking, OK, maybe the other guy made a mistake. You know, Let's try. Um, but after 10 trials, this wasn't so much the case anymore, right? So then subjects also mostly converged to a 50-50 cooperation, okay? Um, yeah? The same subject played this many, many times. Right. So that's how you, but do they learn while, while they play? Well, the thing is that, that's why I'm saying we played this subjects against a computer player because if we had two subjects, right, they would probably, mm -hmm. you, I mean, you can't tell them what to do. They, you be just able to observe this once maybe, and then that's it. And so with the computer player, you can basically say, okay, now we put, you, we put computer players with different ambiguity attitudes, right? Which means they would be more or less um, cooperative, finally, in the beginning at least, right? And, and so every time, so we told our subjects that, that they would play against this computer player, and that they have to decide whether, what to do, right? They, I mean, they were playing this game, right? So they didn't even know what it means to cooperate or not cooperate. They were just trying to um, yeah. basically uh, avoid large forces, essentially. But whenever the game starts again, yeah. they were still playing against the same Oh, no, we told them that, yes, but we told them that the player's changing all the, so in blocks. Okay. So they were told so they that. Sort of so they went back to that. Yeah, yeah. So they knew that it's not the same player all the way through. So we told them after every block that there's going to be a new computer player, so to say. Yeah. Yes. So it's dynamic. It's exactly like this earn model, essentially, right? So basically, if we go up here, so the value, so the v theta that you see there, right, that's determined depends on your um, utility, and it depends on your Bayesian belief about what happened so far, and that's dynamic. Every time you see an interaction, this belief changes, right? Okay, so... Sorry, sorry, one more question. Yeah? Here is also subject number five, which is actually being under compared. Yes. But then the other conversion actually to this... Uh, yes. To this mean, uh, yes, so that's what... That's what you would predict, actually, if you were um, ambiguity-averse, right? So in the beginning, I have only, so I'm suspicious of my environment. I see you for the first time, I think, okay, this guy looks dodgy. Let's <laughs> avoid him and, and, and hunt the, the hair. Of course, I'm kidding. And then after a while, I realize, okay, you, you cooperate 50% of the time, and then I'll do the same. So it is neutral, and then you, you, you converge to this neutral. Yeah, you co so the more data you have, the, the less ambiguity you have. The ambiguity is washed out with the data, so to say. Okay. <clears throat>
Okay, um, then here is just a, a short example of how you can put these two things together. The constraint in um, the policy, meaning that you are restricted in the actions that you can pick, and the information constraint in the belief space, which means that you have ambiguity. So um, what you see on the top is the definition for what you want to optimize in a Markov decision problem. So in case you don't know what a Markov decision problem is, just imagine, this is the example I'm going to explain. I mean, you have to navigate this maze right, from a start to an end. In every cell, you have to decide where do you go, forward, backward, and then the environment has, for example, a wall or a, um, a pit where you can fall in and so on. Right? And you have to make this sequence of decisions. And what you typically want to do is you want to maximize your expected reward, so without these log terms, right? And what we do is basically we just add these two log terms. One is for ambiguity, basically, and the other one is because you have limited um, action capabilities, right? And that allows you then to compute a, a value function, which is basically um, a free energy, again, well, or... That's one free energy that consists of these two variables where we have uncertainty about. So now we have an alpha and a beta, right? Um, and the question is then, what effect does this have? And let's just look at the example that gives you the intuition. Um, so if we look at, um, let's see, what kind of plan do you come up with? Okay, let's look at this second line. Um, so, the, so you have to go to the goal state, right, which is over here, and you start here, I think. Um, and now in the, what happens is there's these question marks in the environment, okay? And so you know everything else, but you don't know what happens in these question marks, okay? So they're like an unknown, I don't know, jungle or something like this, and it's dangerous. You don't know what's in there, okay? So it could be positive or negative about it. Um, now, on the left side, you see alpha is small and the beta is uh, large. So beta large means you believe your environment is friendly, right? So that means you will have positive attitudes towards the question mark. The alpha is small. That means that you cannot compute your actions so precisely, okay? And so the shortest way to go for you would be to go either that way or that way, right? But there's a pit. And if you cannot control your actions precisely because you're limited, then it's better to go the long way around, right? And that's exactly what you do there. You go the long way around, and because you're friendly towards the ambiguity, you go the long way around where the question marks are, right? So you're an adventurer, basically. Um, in the second um, column, you still have imprecise actions, but you are averse to ambiguity. You're scared, right? And what you do is, again, you take the long way around because you cannot choose your action precisely, but you choose the way that does not contain the question marks. Um, and then here, you have basically a higher alpha, meaning you can control your actions precisely, but you believe the world is a bad place. So you take the shortcut, but the one that doesn't contain question marks. Right? And if you can control your actions precisely and... Um, you believe that the world is a great place, you go the shortcut, including the question marks, right? So you see basically how these two things interact and all the combinations. Okay. So now, um, uh, I want to start the next discussion, how I think that... Um, Limited resources lead to the emergence of abstractions, okay? And the basic idea is very simple. Um, imagine that you would have unlimited resources, okay? Um, in that case, for each context in your environment, you would be able to compute an optimal policy, okay? So you would have basically infinitely many optimal policies, and they would be more or less independent from each other. Now imagine that you have limited resources, right? Um, then you may be forced to apply the same kind of policy or at least similar policies to different scenarios, 
right? And that means that you have to abstract, right? Because you're behaving as if different things are the same. That means you have to ignore something and behave the same way towards them. That is abstraction, okay? That's the basic idea. Um, so how do we formalize this? So <clears throat> here is the, um, the trade-off between the utility and the information, right? Um, what's new is, so alpha would be, or this A would be the action again, and this W is a world state, right? And now for, we have a scenario basically where if you just look at what is inside this bracket, where for each world state, you're looking for the best policy in this world state, okay? Um, but now, and, <coughs> and here, this would be a prior, right, over actions that does not depend on the world state. Um, so if you have infinite resources, what you would do is this prior would be irrelevant, right, and you would just pick the best action for each world state. But now, if you don't have infinite resources, then this prior becomes important. And we can now ask what is actually, what would be the optimal prior, right? So that's what I'm doing in blue over there. Okay, so I'm asking over, if I average over all the environments, what's the optimal prior? What does it mean intuitively? Intuitively it means that imagine that um, I'm the prior now, right? And I need to be updated to the posterior. And there's different possibilities, different world states. So if this world state happens, I have to walk over there in information space, right? And if this world state happens, I have to walk over here in the information space and so on. So which is the best prior? Well, the one that is sort of in the middle between all of them, intuitively, right? So it wouldn't be good if I have my posteriors here and my priors over there, okay? Um, okay, so if I do that, you can actually show the optimal prior here is the marginal of this joint distribution over alpha and omega or A and W. And then we can rewrite this equivalently like this, okay? So if we choose the marginal here, the kullback leibler divergence becomes equal to the mutual information. I also said it yesterday. You can think about the mutual information as a special kind of uh, kullback leibler divergence. And this is actually known as the, this is equivalent to the rate distortion problem, right, that we were discussing yesterday. If information and utility that you trade off. Okay, the solution that you have here is the one that's depicted here. It's a self-consistent solution, okay? Um, so that is because we're not only looking for the best posterior, but also for the best prior, okay? And now, um, Self-consistent means that this is not actually a solution, but you would need to iterate these equations to find the solutions, right? And this is what you do in information theory with the so-called blout arimoto algorithm. So what you do is you initialize the prior somehow, and then you run these update equations just that they're there, right? What would the posterior be for this prior? And then what would be the prior for this posterior? and so on. You keep running until they're consistent with each other. That's why it's called self-consistent equation, okay? Um, so basically, while you're running this, the information flows both ways, right? How to update the posterior and how to update the prior. So now let's look at the simple um, example of how this can model um, abstraction. So Let's assume that we have different things in the world, right? So these are different, like, cats and dogs and trees and flowers. And that we play the following game. I show you one of these items, and you have to tell me what it is, and I give you a reward if you get it right, okay? And let's assume, just for argument, that you get three euros. If you guess exactly what it is, you say, okay, this is a, whatever, a Persian cat. Um, if you just recognize it's a cat, you get 220, and if you at least recognize it's an animal and not a plant, you get 160. Okay, I mean, the numbers obviously don't matter. Um, and now, <clears throat> what you see here, if basically information is fairly cheap, abundant, okay, or you have lots of resources, then the best answer is for each item I show you to give, to tell me exactly what it is, right? The utility that you will get is maximal, the three euros, 
you need 3.7 bits to do that in this case, okay? If you have more available, it doesn't improve anything. That's what you need. Now, let's say the information becomes more expensive or you're less capable. Um, then you basically jump, right? And your answer is going to be um, on the intermediate level. You'll just say it's a cat or a dog and so on. If you would basically uh, choose differently, then you would, um, you would lose money, so to say, right? I mean, you could choose to spend this information differently. You could choose to always recognize the duck's hunt, right? But then you cannot tell anymore between, I don't know, trees and flowers or something like that. I mean, depending on your environment, that could be a sensible choice, but in this environment, it would make sense. Um, I can make the information more expensive um, in that then you can do barely any information processing. You see it's just 0.2 bits here. Uh, you distinguish animals and plants. And um, if you have no information anymore, you just say it's a plant. Why would you do that? Because sneakily there was one more plant here than an uh, animal. So it makes sense to just guess that if you can't do anything else. Um, so you see as you change the rationality parameter, you have this sort of uh, phase transition in your, in your response, okay? Um, so here, so this is an ongoing experiment. I don't really have the, I can show you one subject and we've recorded a few more, but um, this is just to give you an idea what we're trying to do, I guess. Um, so what we're doing is that we have um, an identification task. So you see here different uh, ellipses, so to say, that go from line to circle, right? And you have to, and I show you an ellipse, right? And you have to tell me where it is on the line, okay? And basically you have this, you have an action space that looks like this, okay? So you can say, okay, if I show you this ellipse, you would say, okay, you would have to hit this one, right, this button. If you hit this one or that one, that would be wrong, right? Or you could say, okay, let's take, let's take um, uh, less precision, right? Let me choose the action on this uh, row. Then you would just say, okay, it's this one. I don't know which one, this or that, but I'm sure it's here. Or you even coarser, you decide to go here, right? So not only do you need to decide which one is the ellipse that you see, but you also need to decide, and that's important, the level of abstraction that you want to choose, right? Um, so you say, okay, this is sort of a round thing, you know, so that this level is maybe round, uh, straight, and something intermediate, right? So that would be only three distinctions you make in the world. Um, so this would be the utility function. Of course, you get most reward if you basically say precisely what it is and less uh, if you cannot say so precisely what it is, right? So just like in the example with the dogs. So Daniel, yeah. those uh, violet uh, squares above the ellipses? Here, uh, these, and I get, these are, I guess you can see this better here, but it's because these were videos. Some noise. Yeah, some noise, yes. So, um, um, so what we did is basically we manipulated two things, the perceptual noise and the action noise, so to say. Okay, so we had the perception noise was basically the, so these were randomly moving dots, right? And these on the circle, there was some dots that were moving coherently, right? And basically by reducing the percentage of coherently moving dots, this perception becomes harder, okay? Um, and the other thing is that we manipulated the, the reaction time in which you had to decide, right? Um, so the video length was always the same, but the reaction time was different. One in case five seconds, the other one 400 milliseconds, um, at, where you had to make the choice, okay? So, so how do you do that? You should tell the subject that they have a longer time or a shorter time. Yes. And so, okay, I'll show you some preliminary data here. As I said, it was more like to explain to you the idea of what we're trying to do. So this would be 
the six conditions, right? So easy slow would mean easy perception, uh, slow reaction time. That's the easiest condition. Hard fast is the worst, right? And then what you see is that um, initially, when it's easy, obviously you go to higher levels, and as it becomes harder, you go back to the lower levels. Um, now, if you model that with the, the uh, rate distortion model, you get uh, these kind of predictions. So in principle, the same that you move from the top to the bottom. If you look more closely, then there are some effects that obviously this model cannot explain. The most prominent being that if you, go, if you see to the left, that on the borders, you go to the top level, but in the middle you stay in the middle level, yeah, right? And here, um, in the rate distortion model, you don't see that. The reason is that, um, that on the border, you have uh, the perception is easier, right? So it's easier to recognize these extreme values, right? Um, also because there's no neighbors on this side right, that could confuse you. This is not modeled here because in, the, in this rate distortion model, there's no neighborhood relationships. Everything is discrete, right? In fact, this model doesn't care that these are all circles. These could be all different objects, basically, right? So there's uh, clearly one limitation. But the question we can still ask now is um, how optimal do you make your choice, right? Just like we asked yesterday in this study with the rechain. Um, and so you see that, so we've recorded um, like 10 subjects. This would be a representative subject. Um, so you see that there's this rate distortion curve. Again, what is the best utility that you can achieve? And you see that the harder it becomes, right, the more, uh, the less information you have, right, and the less utility you achieve. But you also notice that um, okay, we're lying close to the curve, but we're not lying on the curve, right? So the subjects are not really bounded optimal, and now the thing that we're trying to figure out at the minute is what are the reasons, what are the constraints, the extra constraints maybe that subjects have, what explains this sub-optimality? And I'm not mean, I mean sub-optimal from bounded optimal, right? Uh, <clears throat> And here is basically um, showing which uh, level you should choose optimally, right? So it's basically something like a, a rate distortion curve for which precision level to choose. And you see, for example, also that, that this subject um, would be conservative, right? In the sense that they should actually, considering the, the information that there's the discrimination that they can do, they should choose a higher level, right? Um, but they don't, right? They stay back. So this, if you have points in between, that means that you mix, right? That sometimes you go to this level and sometimes you go to the level below. Um, but you see that you're, you're clearly below. So that's something that we're trying to figure out what are the explanations, basically, for these inefficiencies. OK. So then I would uh, start with the last part um, about learning. And basically, that has two parts. The first part is on structural learning, which is, again, learning of abstractions. OK. So um, this is a bit also of earlier work that I was starting when I was a PhD student. Um, so, so I was always interested in abstractions. Um, the question how they are learned. And then um, in the second part, uh, how to model learning with bound rational decision makers. Um, like when you have parametric functions and then we also have at least one example where we go back to learning of these abstractions, okay? Um, but it's more general. Also, other things. So we also looked at learning with neural nets and stuff like that. So I don't know how much we can squeeze in. Okay, so um, 
the question that basically I was uh, thinking about when I was a PhD student was um, how can you learn when you have variable environments, right? And the example is, for example, okay, you, you, you have different uh, bikes or something like that, right? So there's, uh, you, you learn to ride them. Do you learn something different each time or do you like extract the commonality? And the, the question was that typically when we study learning, right, then we uh, expose people to a particular problem. We observe how they get better over time. We record the learning curve um, and, and make analysis about that. But I was interested in, okay, what happens if I change the learning problem all the time? Okay, do you just always keep learning from zero or do you learn something more abstract in the end? Okay, so that you improve over time even though the learning problem changes all the time. And obviously this can only happen if the learning problems share some commonality, right? So that was sort of the question I was interested in. And so the idea is that if you imagine now that you had these different bikes, right? And you imagine now in the brain there's different um, like dials or so that you can adapt, say synaptic weights or something like this, right? To solve the problems. And then imagine now just to make an argument that there's only two such dials that you turn to try and adapt from one bike to the other, right? And then you would search essentially through this two-dimensional space, right? Um, that's the PowerPoint. It should actually land on the point um, um, to find the new solution, right? But if you now knew that all the bikes actually they share a commonality, then you might figure out that they lie on a subspace, right? They're not independent, essentially, the two parameters that you need to adapt. Um, and if you knew that subspace, right, then you could just basically whiz along that subspace and the exploration would be uh, faster because you would essentially dismiss immediately lots of possibilities that are not promising, okay? So the idea is that if I would be exposed to a uh, varying environment that, share, that, that has structural invariance, that you would learn these invariants, right? And, and then you would become faster to adapt to new problems that belong to the same sort of subspace. Um, <clears throat> so the experiments we did was again on, in this virtual reality robot. So actually, we used the same system also for many of the experiments that I showed you already. Um, so you have here this manipulanda, and uh, on this mirror you have a, basically a projection from a screen you can't see your hand, and so you can create, like, uh, so you can create forces here also. Um, that means you can create, like, virtual objects with virtual dynamics, so to say. Um, so here's one uh, simple experiment that we did. Um, so just to be some motor experiment, right? So you have a reaching task. The subject doesn't see the hand, just the cursor. They the task is to control the cursor from a start to a target. Um, and now we can dissociate the, the, the hand and the cursor movement or make their relationship a bit more complicated, right? So one thing that we could do, for example, is we could introduce uh, what's called the vis-motor rotation, right? So you move um, your hand straight up, but the cursor goes there, right? And then you see, okay, the cursor goes there. You don't see your hand. Um, and you may want to then correct that movement, right? So your hand goes now over there, and the cursor goes there. Um, and over time, when you learn that, the cursor movement becomes straighter again, right? And you learn to move your hand another way. And you don't actually realize that it's a rotation. You just think, when you do this, that there's something strange, and you just adapt to it. It's a little bit like riding a bike, right? Im implicit learning. Um, so, <clears throat> The question is, how can we, how can we model this? So, so this was a, a first uh, experiment that we did in this direction. And what we did in this experiment is that actually uh, most of the time there would be straight movements without perturbation. And then interspersed in this sea of, say, normal movements were individual trials, single trials that had a random uh, uh, rotation between the... Uh, cursor and the hand movement, and so you would have to do a correction, just like it's depicted here. And 
what you see, let's look at the experimental data first, right there. On the very top left, um, you see that we had four different rotations, actually with eight, but plus minus was collapsed into one. So 90 degrees, 70, uh, 50, and 30 degree rotations. And you see, basically, the subject always starts moving straight forward, right? And then there's this correction. Um, and of course, the larger the rotation angle, the bigger this correction is. You also see that in the speed profile, the second bump, right? Or the angular momentum, the same also in the variability pattern. Now, to, to model this, we basically assumed a simple um, optimal control model um, that assumes like linear dynamics and quadratic costs. That means the, basically we model the hand as a point mass right, that has inertia that you want to move. So it's like a model that many people have used in, uh, I guess, in, uh, that have used optimal control. And you would basically trade off two things. On the one hand, you want to go to the target. Right? On the other hand, you don't want to spend too much effort. So there's the trade-off. Um, <clears throat> but now, the problem is when you do optimal control, right, you need to know everything. But the problem is here we don't know the rotation angle. Okay? So basically what, what I did here was I made a model that knew already there's going to be a rotation, okay? but I don't know the rotation angle. And this rotation angle is estimated on the fly from the data that comes in. Right? So basically, we have this control loop where I, I give motor commands. I'm going to go to the target. I get sensory feedback, and I realize, OK, actually, oh, I'm not going where I wanted to go. Right? And then I have a system identification unit that basically says, OK, is there a parameter phi, meaning an angle, that would explain my observation? Right? And then I would adapt that. Um, and of course, depending on the noise, this system could immediately detect this, or if you have a lot of noise and delay in the system, which is the case for humans, right? then it takes longer to realize. And that's why when we model this, you see this in the bottom here, we can also reproduce these kind of trajectories that sort of uh, start out and then go straight for quite a while until it's realized, okay, something's wrong, and then you start correcting. Okay? So you could say, okay, that's nice. So the, 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 this, kind, this simple model sort of reproduces um, this, this data. But what's more interesting is when it doesn't produce the data. Okay? So <clears throat> we, we looked at essentially early trials and late trials. Okay? So what you see here is, as an example, for the 90 degree rotation trajectories on the top left, right? Um, you see uh, in purple the early trials, okay? And then you see that as time goes on, so this, these are average trials, I think over like blocks of 200 trials, so we picked out all the 90 degree <laughs> rotations and averaged them. And you see that, that, that this starts, um, yeah, quite low, and if you look at the speed profile, there's no bump, right? The second bump is not there. Um, the variability is quite high, and as time progresses, you seem to converge to this sort of limit trajectory. And the speed bump comes out, and the variability reduces here. Right? And you can see this also in the bottom. So the minimum distance to the target, uh, the peak of the second speed bump, so it becomes faster, variability goes down. And so what you're looking at here is that uh, the formation of a, of a learning to learn process, or learning to adapt, right? because remember that each single trajectory is an adaptation. Right, that you produce here. So it's some kind of a learning process. You have to adapt your policy. If you didn't, you would not get to the target. Right? That means you have to change your mapping from perception to action. Um, and so we're basically learning to improve this over time. And actually, to me, this is the interesting part. Right? That, is, that cannot be modeled by this, because here I presume already that I know that there's going to be rotations, right? Um, the only thing that I can say is, if I do presume this knowledge, then I can explain the data, but, but how do you get there, right? And um, in, in control theory, it's difficult to manage because control theorists usually always assume that you know more or less everything except a few parameters, right? That's a typical assumption. If you didn't do that, then you come to the realm of reinforcement learning, but then um, 
I guess control engineers are more interested in things like stability and that the system is under control, right, which makes sense if you think about controlling aeroplanes and chemical power plants and I don't know what, right? Um, so they don't want systems that are, they don't know what they're doing, right? They are learning too much. Um, that's right. Okay, so here you see also that the point that I was making about the, the learning to learn, right? So if, if you do um, a control group that does target jumps, so you move, and then while you're moving, the target jumps over here, right? You also need to change, but you don't have to learn anything. You can use the same sensory motor mapping, right? And that's what you see here. There's no, there's no learning effect anywhere, right? You get the stable behavior straight away. <coughs> Okay, so the question is, what is this learning to learn? Can we learn more about it? And so what I did then in the next study was I basically um, had three different groups of people and they would be trained on different things and then I would expose them to the same kind of learning problem, new problem, right? And I would ask, would they adapt to this learning problem differently just because they have had exposure to different statistics before, and maybe they learned different structural invariants, right? And that puts an exploration bias when they have a new, when they have the other problem. Okay. Um, and so the first group was just a naive group, right? That did just straight movements for 800 trials, and then they were exposed to a block of. 60 degree rotations, a block of minus 60, and a, plus of, a block of plus 60. And there you see the learning curves, basically how the movement gets faster and straighter. Um, you also see that this second curve is a little bit, it's the opposite, right? So you have this typical interference effect and this sort of relearning of the first one. So these are all effects that are known in the literature. Um, and then we had the second group who did random rotations, okay? And then we saw that this second group was much faster in adapting and also had reduced interference. Um, but of course the question is, well, the, this random group, maybe it just memorized all the rotations. There was no uh, invariant, right? And so we had a third group that basically was experiencing random transformations, random linear transformations, okay? And you can think of them as being composed of rotations, shearings, and scalings. And they can be quite crazy. Um, and 20% of the trial, we exposed them to rotations, namely exactly these rotations. But these rotation transformations would drown here in a sea of noise, so to say, right? So if, you, if you're looking at invariants from all these trials, then you wouldn't find one, but if you would just memorize everything, of course, then you would, should be able to memorize these uh, 60 uh, degree uh, rotation trials. And so what we found was that this random group performed no better than the, the group that didn't learn initially, right? And suggesting that they were not able, well, first of all, they didn't memorize, right? And they were not able to extract an invariant from from these, say, rather unstructured uh, transformations. And then we had here a, um, a similar experiment in, in, in 3D, where we had two groups, one group that was learning basically uh, rotations around the horizontal and the vertical axis, right? Uh, these are the two groups. And then, of course, we exposed each group to a, uh, 45 degree either horizontal or vertical rotation. And then you see, maybe not so surprising, the uh, horizontal group adapts faster to the horizontal rotation and the um, vertical group faster to the vertical rotation. But what you also see is if you then look at the endpoint spread of uh, where subjects are pointing, right, that you find that the, the horizontal group tends to be spread more in the horizontal direction, right? And this, these are not after effects, these are like active explorations, right? Because we had like a, a washout block before here. And the vertical group tends to explore more stretched in this direction because they learned that this is sort of the, most of the time this was the direction that was relevant when they were adapting in the training trials, right? 
Um, then here is a, um, a more recent study about the same idea. So we again, um, so we were asking again about can you learn structure? So you remember this uh, experiment from yesterday, right? Where you have basically combining sensory information with your prior knowledge to do the tennis example and everything, right? And here the question was, okay, so instead of just learning, um, um, okay, ah, here. Instead of just learning uh, one uh, dimension, right, I could, have, I could say I have a two-dimensional hidden variable. So let's call it Sx and Sy, right? And this, and this could be like having any relationship that I want. They could be, for example, correlated or something like this. They could have a, a structure in this space, right? And so I don't only have the, the say, the, this bias that I have to estimate in the, or where's the tennis ball going to land, right? If I put an extra bias in, I don't know if I have to estimate it in the x direction, but maybe also, so it's not tennis anymore, I don't know what this would be, maybe badminton, right? Where you have also the other dimension. And to see, um, can you actually learn this structure, right? And so that's what we did. So, so this would be uh, one group that would basically have no structure. So what you see is basically a Gaussian cloud. So we have these two um, variables that would correspond to the target position in the example yesterday, right? Um, but here it would correspond to that you basically add like a, um, a bias of where you have to go. Um, and so here you uh, basically look onto the top of a Gaussian distribution, okay? And that means that these two variables are not correlated, right? If I tell you Sx, then you don't know anything about Sy, right? And the other way around. And so, <clears throat> Um, if I show you now a data point, this, this red one, right, and you have to guess what is uh, Sx and Sy, then, of course, you just say, okay, it's there. This would be like the example where you, where you have reliable sensory feedback, right? You know exactly where the target is. But if I tell you now the target is somewhere here, right, uh, any of these points, then you combine that with your prior, right, which would be Okay, most of the time it's here, but I don't know, and you cut out the slice, okay? However, if you knew that the two things are tightly correlated like that, right? And now I'm telling you the target is somewhere here, right? Then you would know precisely where it is, right? Because knowing this coordinate precisely intersected with this tells you exactly what the other coordinate is. So that was the idea. Can you, basically, can we take this uh, Wolpert experiment, make it in 3D, such that we have a two-dimensional plane where we have two hidden variables that you have to estimate in each trial, right? And we impose a structure in this two-dimensional plane, namely a simple correlation structure in that case, okay? Could you learn? Um, from just, uh, yeah, in the end, these are the critical trials, right? Can you basically learn this correlation structure that, that if I give you information about one axis, you know what is the value of the other axis? So that's what we did. And also this experiment took quite a very long time because um, um, it didn't work for a long time because we didn't do it for enough days, okay? That was the... So the, the learning of this correlation is very, very slow. Um, and I think in the original experiment, there were 2,000 trials. And after 2,000 trials, you hardly see anything. And then only after we realized, okay, we have to do many more trials, we started to see an effect. So we were quite perplexed. Um, so the trials that we did was that we trained people um, full feedback. That means uh, I show you exactly the point, right? Um, and the partial feedback, which yesterday was this cloud. Today is also a cloud, but it's basically a cloud that's like really stretched like a, a long ellipse or like a line almost, right? Um, <clears throat> and if you remember this, right, um, that 
the slope tells you basically uh, um, what uh, you know, right? So if the slope is one, we said yesterday, then you don't have any feedback, right? There's no information. The best you can do is go to the, if you don't see anything, play in the dark, right? You, you go to the middle of your prior. Um, and if you have information, full information, then you would have a zero slope, right? You would always, independent of where the target was, you would go to the right thing. Um, and now what you see here is the correlated and the uncorrelated group, right? And I'm just looking at the trials with no feedback, right? And in the no feedback trials, you don't know where this thing is. You should always go to the middle of your prior, like we said. And you see that they all have a slope of one, more or less. Um, and now the, the interesting question is what happens in the partial feedback trials, right, where I just have this line, okay? And of course this line could be uh, vertical or horizontal. These are the, oops, two possibilities here. And you see that in the uncorrelated group, there is no, because there also wasn't anything that they could learn, right? There, there, there was no effect there, right? Um, but in the correlated group, there were effects, right? And if you would know this correlation perfectly, then you would expect this here to be zero, right, in these trials, because you know then exactly what the position of the other coordinate should be, but you see it's not zero, right? So for example, I don't know, the subject three is particularly bad, right? But even here, so this is the best case that we have. Um, and this is after, like 4,000 trials. So you can also look at how this slope evolves, right? It starts with one. In the correlated group, it stays at one because you never can learn a correlation. And in the correlated group, you see, so we only look at the trials where we have this partial feedback of the bar, right? You see how slowly, slowly, um, so at this point, you've done in total 4,000 trials, right? But it's only 630 or so um, partial feedback trials here. Um, you're slowly moving away, right? And you've not even learned 50%. Um, uh, in contrast, learning the mean of the distribution is fast. And this works for both groups, right? Um, and the question is, okay, how can we... How can we model this? Because there's basically two kinds of learning going on. In each trial, you have to learn or adapt to what is basically this, uh, this hidden variable, which in the old experiment was the position of the target. In this case, it would be the cursor shift. Right? Um, and at the same time, you have to learn this correlation structure. But this correlation structure you would learn over many trials because that's basically the prior that you have to figure out, right? So, so in a sense that the variation that you have in every trial is that this, this hidden variable changes in every trial, but the correlation structure stays the same, right? And so this is what you would learn, the, inver the structural invariant that I was talking about. Right? So the way you would model this is with a hierarchical Bayesian model so you have here on the left, you want to basically know what, this is the posterior, what is the probability of this hidden variable given my observations, right? And the observations are split in two parts, namely my current observation, little d, and all the past, the big capital D, okay? And essentially the, the, the PS with the capital D is my prior, right? And this prior now itself is, um, um, is uh, where is it, would be corresponding to this or it's, uh, to this whole thing, right? Because you have now also um, a hyper, this prior is parameterized, right? And you have another distribution which would learn, in this case, this covariance matrix, right? And then you have a belief also about the mean and the covariance matrix for this prior. And so over time you will learn this and you will learn in each trial what is the current shift. Right? These are the two things. Now when you model this, what you will notice is that um, basically for, uh, for, uh, for this Bayesian model, 
it's super easy to learn this correlation structure, right? If I show you, like, I don't know, dozens of points, you would immediately know, okay, this is the correlation that explains this. And then you have a really hard time to say, okay, why, why does it take for subjects thousands of trials to figure out this correlation structure, right? And the, the only way you can model this is basically by putting into, into this um, hyperprior that this correlation is extremely unlikely, right? So you have a prior that basically says the uncorrelated, that the fact that these two are uncorrelated has a, a, a huge prior probability, right? And then you need a lot of evidence to move away from that, right? Um, and when you do that, when you model it like that, so then these are basically simulations where you see how you basically learn this slope, then you get sort of similar curves that are very uh, noisy and very slow in moving away from, from the one, right? That means that you slowly learn this correlation over thousands of trials, but this only works when you basically put in that you have a very, very strong prior that this should be not correlated. Okay. Um, we're doing in time 10. Um, okay. So then uh, the question is then that was also a follow up question from these kind of studies. How should we select um, between different structures, right? And uh, um, a structure would now mean that you basically, it's like a parameter and model selection problem, right? So you have some, uh, you have some observation, let's call it D, then you have some parameter S and you have some model M, right? And if you have different structures, this would correspond to different M's that would basically have all different S's that would trace out the subspace of that structure, so to say, right? That's the, the idea. Um, and so in the end, this becomes a question of, of model selection and model comparison, right? Um, and the, the Bayesian way to, to do model comparison is to basically say, okay, what is the uh, probability of this data point under model one and what's the probability of the data point under model two? If we assume that we give equal prior weight to both kinds of models. And for that, we need to basically compute the so-called uh, marginal likelihood, okay? Um, so what does that mean? i give you quickly an intuition. So if we have two models, let's call it model one and model two, right? These models can explain certain data, right? They give probability to this data. Now a simple model will basically be a model that is fairly concentrated, right? That means it can only explain uh, a relatively small number of things in the world, okay? That would be a simple model. And that gives um, um, higher probability to that because the probabilities always have to add up to one, right? A complex model would be um, one that gives probability mass to everything, right? Or to relatively lots of things. So maybe, Maybe an intuitive example would be, okay, what is a complex model if something happens in your life and you say, okay, fate, right? Fate was this or that. So fate can explain everything, right? That would be, in this uh, jargon, a complex model. And something more specific, like, I don't know, you make some kind of scientific explanation maybe about how a stone falls or something like that, that can explain only a certain amount of things, right? That cannot explain maybe why you had an argument last night or something like this, right? So more specific model. Okay, and that means now if I give you a data point that is here, right? Um, then both models would be able to explain this data point, right? In particular, the complex model will always be able to explain this point, right? And the question is which model should you use? And if you basically take this base factor, or margin likelihood, you will choose the one that gives the higher probability to this data point, right? You should choose, and that means that if two models explain the data equally well, choose the simpler one, right? Um, 
And so this marginal likelihood, um, where does it come from? Um, well, it's basically just you want to know what is the probability of the model given the data, right? And that is just phase rule. So then we have this, right? Um, and to get to to get this, essentially you have to uh, basically uh, get rid of this S here, right? So this would be the joint distribution. Then you get rid of the S, and then you have it, which is what's written there. Um, now, <clears throat> what does this? What's the intuition behind this? So this here explains to you, right, what is the likelihood of this data given the model and this particular parameter setting. And of course, in the complex model, you will always find a parameter setting such that the data is explained well, right? And that is what you see, for example, here, right? In, if you just look at the square distance um, from, from the model to the data points, this model will be better than that one. But because it's more complex, there's also going to be many parameter settings that will not fit the data well, right? And in the simple model, there will not be so many parameter uh, settings that don't fit so well, presuming that there is one that fits well, right? And so what you can think about that is, uh, the marginal likelihood is like, an, you, you take the average over all the parameters that you're considering for the model, right? And look at the average likelihood. And if you have a complex model, then you, the average likelihood may be not so high. There is maybe one or two parameter settings that fit well, but then there's like millions that don't fit well, and that will take this likelihood down, right? And so, <clears throat> what happens is if you use the marginal likelihood to score the model complexity, uh, to, score, to decide between models, sorry, then you will take into account basically automatically the model complexity, right? That's the, the mystery of Bayesian model selection, I guess. And so we also want to test this in an experiment, and what we did was basically we uh, showed people um, these dots, right? And we asked them to, to draw a line that basically would fit to these dots, okay? And um, what we did is we trained people on two different kinds of models. Um, we used Gaussian processes with different length scales. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. Just um, I'll show you the picture. So the Basically, the two different models were like this. One was sort of smoother, and the other one was more wiggly, okay? And so you train on these models, and as you can see, you can have basically the same kind of dots, right? But depending on the model that you've been trained, you would draw a different line, right? And what we did was we trained um, the people, each person on both models, and we had basically uh, a color cue in the background that looked like a, uh, yeah? Sorry, so what do you mean to train uh, people on the model? So the training on the model means that um, basically I can draw from this Gaussian process, I can draw samples, right? And I can draw curves. Um, and then I would show you the samples and then you would have to guess the line from the Gaussian process that belongs basically to the same samples. And if you do that many times, right, then you will learn that, okay, this here is smoother, and here I would probably try a more wiggly line, right? So they would try and guess this underlying line. Um, and so we had basically a cue in the background with color, and it showed some kind of a, a mountain range that could be more wiggly or flatter, right? So you had some, some cue to know which uh, which model would fit now with these points, and you could learn this over time. And then the interesting part is now when you expose them to, to test trials, right? And in these test trials, there was no queue, and they had to decide now which model they should use to connect the dots, right? And um, Essentially, the test trials were chosen. So if we look for the Gaussian process, 
So it's a little bit like a Gaussian. Um, we look at the marginal likelihood, it has this form, okay? And basically this marginal likelihood splits into two parts, uh, like a, a data fit error, right? And the complexity term. And in this complexity term, um, we have the, um, basically the weakliness of the, of the model, right? So the more weakly one has the higher complexity and the other one, the, the smoother one has the, the lower complexity. And then um, we chose these trials such that the, the data fit error, right, that we can compute from the Gaussian process would uh, be the same for both models, right, such that the only difference would lie in the complexity. So the question is, then, if you have a trial where basically both models explain the data equally well, which one do you choose, right? That was the question. And, lo and behold, they chose the simpler model, like they uh, should, right? So you see here, the, we, we tried basically two, uh, three different levels of, um, of this data fit error, right? And most of the time, um, the subjects would choose the, the simpler model. Um, and if you looked at all the trials and said they, uh, and assumed that they would choose according to the base factor, right? So that would be then the experimental probabilities and the theoretical probabilities, they should roughly lie on this um, diagonal, which um, was roughly the case. And we checked for two more things, then we had con two control experiments, one was, um, for checking for physical effort, because it makes more effort, right, to draw the wiggly line than the smooth one. So we just had one where you clicked a mouse button, left and right, to see whether it's simpler or uh, the more complex that you want. Um, and we also looked at the, um, the spatial frequency by doing a um, control experiment where actually the more wiggly line can be the simpler model than the straight line if the prior distribution over this is very narrow, right? If it's always the same line, then this model will only explain a small data set, so to say, right? And this one, if it has a lot of variance, will maybe explain a larger data set. And so now the situation's reversed, where basically the wiggly becomes the simpler model, right? Because in the end, it's just about how many data sets can you explain. And in, when we did that, subjects would again choose the, the simpler model. So it was not, so the more wiggly one. So in, in the test, so you, in the test trials, right, only we're talking about the test trials where basically the, this data error term, right, where both models would explain the, the dots equally well, right, and then, so it looked like this shape, essentially, and then you would also pick this shape, even if it's, it's more wiggly. So, despite the fact that now the model is more complex in terms of number of parameters, they choose, the, they, they choose it because there's a smaller variance. Uh, yeah, but in Bayesian terms, it's not more complex, right? This is yeah, the simpler model, yeah. yeah it it's more wiggly in terms of spatial but frequency. But it, I think it's more than in terms of polynomial, right? I would say that ah. Sure, but that is because, yeah, but that is because this, this notion of model complexity is most of the time okay, but if you want to be strict, it would not be okay because, because what you see here is the, the prior distribution matters over these parameters, right? So if, even if you have a, a higher order polynomial, um, but there's only like, uh, I don't know, say, one value for one of the coefficients, right, then it wouldn't be so complex because it's always the same and, and you can predict it. So, yeah, so that would be a discussion about how you should measure the model complexity and if you want to be a Bayesian, then the complexity would basically just be, okay, how many data points can you explain, so to say. Okay. Um, Okay, so now um, I 
start uh, uh, with something that looks slightly different, but then we come back again to the abstraction problem in a little bit, okay? Um, how to model uh, learning with parametric models. Um, and so what we thought was, okay, if we take this um, optimization criterion and now we assume that our posterior belongs to a parametric family. Let's, for example, say it's Gaussian or whatever. How, how do we then uh, improve? How do we basically determine this? And obviously, uh, uh, an obvious answer would be to try gradient descent. And so you, you take this whole thing as an objective, and you do gradient descent on the parameters that you want to learn. So for example, if the distribution depends on theta, right, then you would take the derivative with respect to theta, and you can actually write the update rule like that, um, because, well, some people call it the log trick, right? So what's nice about this is that the derivative just is there in the log, and you know the expression um, of the distribution, so you can do this derivative, and this term here is, so to say, um, without derivative, and this expectation then can be taken, right? Um, so you can do an online update, right? I can just look at s samples from W and A and update my theta for each sample, right? A, a stochastic online update. Um, okay, and we tried this out in, um, in several scenarios. Um, so one, the first one, uh, was a thought experiment where we said, okay, what if a spiking neuron was acting like a bounded rational decision maker? How would, what would this neuron do, okay? And essentially, um, the idea is that we have different spike trains that come in they have a synaptic weight, right? Then they're, uh, they're summed up, like they have this um, postsynaptic potential that's summed up, and then they're fed through some activity function, and then according to that, uh, spikes are produced with certain probability, right? And this neuron basically also has a reward signal, okay? And uh, this reward signal depends, of course, on the spike trains that come in and the spike train that comes out. And the question is, now what would this neuron do, right? How would it adjust its weights if it were to use this kind of uh, update rule, okay? And so that's what we do. Basically, we say, okay, we want to find the weight that is the optimal trade-off between the reward and the limited information between input and output spike train. <coughs> And if you do the math, you will get basically an update equation um, that looks like this. And the intuition behind it is actually not so difficult. So if we plot delta R, so delta R is the difference in reward that you get for firing versus not firing, right? Because you only have these two actions, so to say. Um, and now, if the information plays no role, you get this sort of this uh, sharp curve, right? So, if the reward for firing is positive, right, then you uh, basically you increase the weights, right, to make it more likely that you will fire again. If the reward is negative, then you don't, then you actually decrease the weight slightly, right, um, because you don't want to fire in that case. Okay, and now what this log term is doing in the end is it's, it's taking the, the baseline firing rate into account, right? And so for example, if, uh, um, if the betas vary, so this, let's take the extreme case, it's always easy to understand, right? So if the beta is zero, that means you only care about the information, then you basically have, you have a flat line. That means you don't deviate from the average firing rate anymore, right? 
um, when you have the beta infinity case, you just care about the reward, and the average firing rate is of no concern to you. Right? And if you have betas in between, then the adaptation rule basically takes both things into account. Right? So you want to increase the firing rate when the reward is positive, but you don't want to deviate too much from the average firing rate because that would mean that you have to upset your system a lot. So basically you get something like a, um, a neuron that doesn't want to deviate too much from the average firing rate, which in the end then turns into a neuron that basically economizes on the synaptic weights. Okay? So we we'll can see this in a simple example. So this was uh, just an, an example experiment. So assume that we have a, a signal spike train, right, that then is translated into other spike trains that are more or less correlated with this spike train. Um, your neuron sees only these intermediate spike trains and wants to recreate the old spike train. Right? That's a simple um, problem where you have an easy reward function that's there every time you're, you create a spike that coincides with the spike in the signal, spike train, you would get a reward, otherwise there's no reward. And then you see what happens, so if you, uh, if you just care about reward, then your neuron will fire all the time and will have really high weights because um, this increases the chance that you will, at least by accident, produce a coincidence with the signal spike train, right? But if you have this uh, information punishment where you don't want to deviate too much from your average firing rate, then you see that the weight growth here is limited compared to here, right? Um, and that you still achieve uh, a similar level of utility. So it's again like a, whatever, 95% or so. Um, okay, so that was, uh, as I said, it was a thought experiment. So you say, okay, the, the bounded rational neuron would basically be a neuron that uh, doesn't deviate too much from the mean firing rate and that economizes on its weights. Um, then as a second attempt, we thought, okay, can we apply this to a, an artificial neural network, so made of many neurons? And again, with a, using the same kind of um, update rule, of course, the representation of this probability distribution is different in each case. Um, and we try two different scenarios. One where basically the network is composed of neurons that each neuron is bounded rational, or the scenario where we regard the network as one bounded rational decision maker, so to say. Um, so these are the scenarios. So the network was like this with the inputs, then the two layers and the softmax output layer that was important because then you can interpret this output layer as um, probability distribution, right? So we need that in order to be able to apply mutual information and so on. Um, and then these are the two scenarios. In the one scenario, basically, each neuron is a bound rational decision maker. Or, um, so you have the uh, utility that is for everybody, so you just do normal backpropagation with that, and then you basically uh, also don't want to deviate too much, so that becomes basically a weight regularization, right? And for the network as a whole, um, we also do just ordinary backpropagation, but with this whole term. But again, you can think about this, in both cases, you can think about it essentially as a regularization that we're doing in the learning process. And then we tried this out on um, this uh, uh, identification of written hand digits, the MNIST data set, um, and we compared it to other methods um, just to see how well it compares. I mean, this was never designed to do uh, recognition of hand written digits or anything like that. Um, and then so you see here, the classification error um, for the individual neurons and for the network as a whole. And these are basically errors that are achieved by, um, yeah, by recent algorithms, right, that use uh, 
other regularization me methods like drop out or drop connect and so on. And this is not the best, but it's definitely in the same sort of league, right? Um, that's what we found. And we also tried it out for a, um, a convolutional network. And again, there it wasn't the best, but in the same um, sort of league. So, so it seems that to use um, the DKL as a regularizer in a um, neural network setting also seems to work fairly well. That is basically what we found in this study. Yeah? What about the training time? Does it, um, is it better on the training time for it? Um, no, I think it was, oh, would you mean until it converges compared to the other methods? Yeah, I mean, um, Yeah, that's true for the beta. Yeah, so the the, B, the beta does influence the the training time, of course, because the trade off the accuracy, like you say. Um, I'm not sure now how the training time compared to this one, when we have this like similar um, accuracies. I would have to look, but I don't think there will be much different because otherwise I would remember that we had discussions about this with my, I mean, with my student, I would expect. Um, but I would have to look, so I can look up later if you want. Um, okay. So then um, we want to use this idea again. Um, so this idea of, uh, with the using neural networks, we use it also in the context of the, um, learning abstractions um, when coupling action and perception. So let me explain to you first the, the setup without the parametric part, and then we do the second part where we introduce parameters. Um, so before we had this simple situation with two variables essentially, right, the world state and the action, and you would choose a policy for each world state, and you could have abstractions. Uh, basically that are encoded in the prior and so on. And now we have three variables. Okay, we're slightly getting more complex. Um, so we have a world state, then we have a perceptual state, if you want, O, and then we have an action state, A. Okay? And the thing is that so we call this the serial scenario because the action doesn't know about the world state except through what the observation states tell the action. Okay? So to say. And, um, and usually you would think about this perception action thing separately, right? That's also what people would do in robotics because later we have a, like a robotics application that you have somebody that figures out the perception problem and the other one figures out the action problem and then you sort of try to put these things together afterwards, right? Um, and here, what we would do is we would basically optimize both things at the same time. So we have a utility function that we want to optimize. And then we have two basically constrained information channels. One is from world to per perceptual state. And the other one is from perceptual state to action. Right? And I have two parameters with which I can regulate um, the accuracy, say, or how much information I want to allow. And the, what we're doing here is we're basically optimizing for the um, posteriors and the prior. So we get, again, a set of self-consistent equations. Only this time we have four of them because we have one more variable. Um, so how can we read them? So let's first look at this equation. It's fairly easy. Um, so in this equation, you have given an observation, and you have to select an action. And what you do is you have a prior over the action, and then you optimize this. And this is basically your expected utility, where you average over the unobserved uh, world states, given your observation. Right? This is just the base posterior. And this is not put in. This sort of falls out from this model like that. Okay. Um, so that's pretty clear, but the question is, what is the perceptual model? 
the one that maps from the world state to the observation state. And so this has also a utility function that's given down here. Right? So the observation state is picked in such a way that essentially on uh, average over all possible actions, the action stage will be able to get a lot of uh, utility and will basically uh, not burn too much information. Right? So basically you create an observation that is first of all, say, understandable for the action and also creates a lot of utility, right? Because that's what you want. So um, you can think about it as a, some kind of feature selector that appears. And what, what this guy, the information this guy transmits um, depends on the next, on, on the action stage, so to say, right? Um, so what can you do with this? So this is... Uh, just a little toy example that my PhD students come up with, as uh, Tim. Um, so imagine there's different animals that have different sizes, right? Um, and there's different actions that you can take. So for example, you can run away. From the big animals, you should always run away. And for the little animals, there's maybe different ways you can hunt them, like different techniques or so. Um, um, and there's also like techniques that you can, that are not so specific, where you also get the utility where you do the same thing to the animals, sort of thing. Um, <coughs> and what you see now is that um, in, in this scenario, uh, on the top left, right, you would see like a typical way to think about the problem. You say, okay, I have the animal size, then I have a perceived animal size, which is the true size plus some noise or something like that. That's indicated by this diagonal, right? And then this is used by the action module to make the decision. Um, in the bottom, it's not like that. In the bottom, there is basically economies, uh, information economies, and that means that for the little animal, it makes sense to, so the perception module is the one on the left, uh, the, for little animals, it makes sense to distinguish the three little animals, right, and waste information on that. Um, but it doesn't make sense, for example, to distinguish the big animals because the big animals all have the same action, right? You, of course, this was in the utility function, but uh, still. Um, um, the big animals basically don't, if you distinguish them, that has no utility advantage for you, so the perception module will also not distinguish them because that would be a waste of information. Um, and what you can do now is that if you now change the action module Right? So I make, for example, the action more imprecise. Then, if you treat action and perception separately, of course, nothing will happen. But in the lower case, if I now say, okay, I cannot um, choose my actions precisely anymore, then I will basically take more generic techniques that are simpler. Right? But that will also then have consequences for the perception because if the action module doesn't distinguish anymore between different... Um, animals in terms of action, then it makes no sense to waste resources in perceptually distinguishing them. And then you will, in this case, just distinguish two categories of animals, large and small, say, for example. And so the, I guess the philosophical idea behind this is that, and, and that was already the case when I talked about abstractions earlier, that the way you perceive the world depends on the computational resources you have, right? So. Um, the, the less resources you have, then you have to carve up the world more economically than if you have more resources. Sorry, yeah. So how much is uh, uh, empirically uh, I mean, reasonable from our point of view of the perception style? So I think we all know that uh, I mean, humans uh, have a sort of entry level categorization of these things. I mean, it's not that you see a cat and you can think uh, oh, this is an animal. Yeah. So I wonder how flexibility actually we have in our process yes. to actually fine tune uh, yes. the amount of information that we dedicate to discriminate this so rather than being something more, more automatically driven perhaps by tools experience and after your application to the world in which we need it. Yeah. So I had this discussion before when I was giving talks about this about um, 
like visual psychologists. And then um, we actually both agreed that maybe for humans, this model is not too great because, um, because there's so many things that you can do, right? Um, that, that it makes sense for perception to be fairly generic and fairly independent from, from the action part. Um, I guess this, I mean, that was the argument that we were having, that maybe this is a better model of, say, like insect vision or so, where, where you have more limited setup or, and where this evolves more through evolution than more than um, an ontogenetic setup. But still, I believe that, I mean, that doesn't invalidate this model because what I'm saying is that the perception should be coupled to the action. But if we're saying that humans can do so many things such that it doesn't make sense to restrict the perception too much just because there's too many possibilities, right, that then these two things become a bit more independent again. But I guess still in humans there are studies right, that look at the connection between action and perception, that if you learn, for example, to manipulate a new object in a new way, that then also I guess the perception of the object changes in some sense because you know then what you have to attend to and everything. Right? So, so I guess to some extent it's true, but not in the extreme case I'm making here that all of us, you know, that I don't know, your motor cortex is, you, you're paralyzed and all of a sudden you, there's only like small and big animals in the world. But, yeah. Even though, so, I don't know if you know, Neil Spierbaum who's working with ALS patients. Um, um, he, that lose basically all connection with the world in terms of action. One of his claims is that, of course that's not proven, but he's always saying that then, that then you lose also the, the the ability to think and to, uh, yeah, maybe also perception to some extent, I don't know. But yeah, I think in this extreme version for humans. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can talk afterwards. Yeah. 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 Couldn't you pack all the information in the utility function into the prior? Then you don't need the utility function. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so this is the, the general discussion, I guess, about active inference. Yeah. So, yes, you can do that. So, um, in fact, the two are. Um, Where's the clearing thing? Or here, here. In fact, the two, I guess, are equivalent, right? So I can write, for example, P, A, if we just have, say, one variable as an example, okay? <clears throat> so this is the thing that I've been showing you the whole time, right? But now you could say, okay, why do you write it like this? Let's write it. Differently, let's write this as, okay, let's see, um, PA, and then we do log PA, P0A, and then I would have to put E beta UA, I think. Okay, so I could write it like this. This is the same. And now, I could, if I wanted, uh, okay, this is not normalized, right? But I could, in principle, uh, I mean, the normalization is just a constant, so if, for the optimization, it wouldn't make any difference. I could call this now QA, right? And that would be, I could say, this is my desired, this, you, you called it prior. I would maybe call it desired distribution, but we mean the same thing. And then basically all you would have to do is basically adjust this distribution PA, this is the one you want to vary, right, to match this one as close as possible. Yeah. And then and now you could, basically you could make different stories. So here the story was that 
I have this prior and I try to go away from the prior and I try to optimize this utility. The story that you would make would be, okay, I have this, I call it now the desired distribution, yeah. right, to be clearer. I have this desired distribution. Um, now I have basically somewhere where I can change this distribution P that I want and I want to make it as close as possible to my desired distribution, yeah. right? And I mean, both things would do exactly the same, right? Yes. So yes. it just depends whether you, what, whether you like better to talk about utilities or you like better to talk about desired distributions, but in the end, mathematically, they do the same thing. But, but Occam's razor has now eliminated one of two concepts. I mean, here you have a prior and a utility function, and then you have a desired function. Um, well... I, I don't know, I would still say, I mean, that's what's the argument from before, right, that the log probability would also be, uh, it's like a utility, right? So, yeah, I mean, for me... You only need one name. You only need one name. Is that true? I don't know. The desired distribution and the utility. For me, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you say prior, then... I wouldn't say it's wrong, but for me that would be confusing. But because I, when I'm talking about price, I mean something different. I mean not the thing that you desire, but the thing that you want to get away from, if you can, right? Essentially, that's the logic okay. in the price that I'm talking about. And the, 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 prior that's the thing that you call prior is the thing that you want to get to, but you don't know how. So it's like the, the target. So, so in, the, in some sense, it's okay to call them price, but in some other sense, they're like almost uh, opposite things, right? Like one thing you want to get away from, the other one you want to get to. Um, okay, but I guess this is arguing about the names, which you can always do, but I think more importantly is that the, the, the math is the, more or less the, the same, right? The same. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So... Um, then I said we can apply the same idea to um, when we have basically parameterized distributions. Um, so that's what we tried here. Um, another of my PhDs from Jan. Um, so she used uh, a now simulation of the now robot. And the idea was that to make it slightly more realistic, even though it's still a toy problem. So what's more realistic is that as the, we use the neural network for the perception part, right? So we have two distributions, perception and action. So the perception distribution was a neural network that got basically a pixel image from the camera. Um, so that part's quite realistic. The action part was then simple because we only had four different actions, okay? And we also had only four different world states. And the four different world states are these different mugs that you see there, okay? And the mugs could have basically... Um, a handle on the left, on the right, on both sides, or no handle at all, okay? And depending on the handle, you, there's different ways you can grasp it, right? So if it's on the left, you have to, uh, you can grasp it on the left. If it's on the right, you can grasp it on the right. Or you can grasp these with both hands also, right? It would be a waste, you waste one arm movement, but it would be a generic arm movement that always works, except for the mug that has no handle, okay? And so that's what's illustrated with this utility function. So the highest utility would be if you always grasp the mug with the grip that's perfect for it, so to say, right? You grip the left handle mug with the left hand, the right with the right hand, and the one that has two handles with both hands, I guess. You could also do it with one, but we assume with both hands is the best. But you also get the utility if you do the two-hand grip with the mugs that have only one handle, right? And then there's the, the, the mug that has no handle, and there you should basically have the action where you don't do anything so it doesn't slip. It's just an example. Okay, and so the question was now, we do the same thing just parametrically, right? Here a neural network, and here a simple um, um, multivariate distribution. So this would be just a simple feedforward network, nothing special. Just compute the gradient with respect 
to these parameters, right, using this log trick that I said before, applying the same idea. Um, and this is uh, the action module, which simply learns um, a uh, categorical distribution, right, to map the X to one of these four actions. Um, and this is what you get. So depending on the beta values, again, that you set, right, the betas are generous, you will always do the perfect action. If the betas are intermediate, you will just distinguish basically also in your observation space, mux with handles versus mux without handle. Um, and if you have basically uh, no resources, then there's just always one action and there's just one state, right? So, so again, you see that the, the way you carve up the world would depend on on this uh, accuracy that you can afford or the information resource you have. So, uh, yeah. Here the perception part, uh, does it, I mean, does it really play a role, right? I mean, the perception is always the same. It's not that you're manipulating. In which part? Here? So, I mean, in general. In general? In general? Yeah. Yes, yes, it does. So you, you get the pixel image, right, that's fed into the neural network. And this neural network then produces an output x Right? Okay. And this x is then mapped to the action here. Sure, but, but what is the difference in, in case uh, you didn't have this uh, perception model and you just had uh, a knowledge, a perfect knowledge uh, of the, the handle there to handle the design? Ah, yeah, yeah, but the difficulty is you don't have that knowledge, right? So the, the question was sort of can you. I mean, this was the, in IRIS, which is like a robotics conference, so the question was assume I have two separate modules, one for perception and one for action, right? And the, and the action module was a simple parameterized distribution in our case, but the perception module was actually quite realistic, like uh, just a neural network where you optimize the parameters. And now you want to couple the two things. And the idea was, okay, let's couple them like this with this uh, equation that we have and update it. And, and basically, it worked and you get this um, effect that depending on how you choose the betas, the, the way you make distinctions is different. Okay, um, right. So then there's like two, I think, last studies that I quickly can present. Um, so it should just fit with the time. So also this idea that um, limited resources should lead to an optimal um, um, division of labor. So I, for me, that is coupled with this idea of the, um, um, of the abstraction. And what I ultimately would like to understand how um, maybe these limited resources lead to formation of hierarchies and, and, uh, and as it says here, division of labor. So if you think, for example, um, about uh, a company or something like that, right? If everybody was, had unlimited abilities, then there would be no need to join together to form a company or to divide labor or something like that, right? But if everybody is limited somehow, then we have an incentive to say, okay, I'm limited, you're limited. But if we join together, we have more processing power and we can solve new problems, right? And, um, and we can increase the utility for everybody, so to say. Um, and um, yeah, so you see that in the shop where, for example, then there tends to be this hierarchical formation that seems to be efficient, right? That's what I would like to understand. I don't know, then you have also these different time scales of abstraction that arise that, I don't know, the CEO of the company decides things on a time scale of years maybe, and in the shop, the shop assistant makes talks to a customer on a time scale of minutes maybe, right? Um, but this should be a general principle, maybe also applicable to brains with simple neurons that you join together. Each neuron by itself is pretty useless, but if you put them together, they do amazing things. Same is true for humans, right? Each human by itself would be uh, not so impressive, but as, uh, as big groups, we can do impressive things. Um, so 
yeah, I mean, these are first steps towards these ideas, I guess. Um, so here, again, um, a model where we say, okay, we have three variables, just like before, with a slight difference, such that now we have basically the action module can still see the world state. That's the only difference from before, okay? Um, but this gives now rise to different interpretations. So with world state, then the world state is turned into an X, which you can think of as a selector. Okay, so this guy selects between experts that are indexed by X, and the expert then looks at the W and makes a decision about the W. Right? So, so you get basically like a mixture of expert systems. And then the question is how <clears throat> how do you divide basically the work between these experts? Because um, there's just one utility function, right? So we assume there's a utility function that depends on the world state and the action. Um, and now the selector and these experts, first of all, you have to decide what should I be an expert about? And you have to then decide, okay, which expert should I select? Okay? And so the problem formulation is very similar to before. I want to optimize utility. I have this um, limited capacity channel um, for the selector and here also for the action. So what's new here is that we have these, um, these three variables, right? And here, basically, x is given because we said this is the index of the expert, and the expert has to make a decision from world state to action, right? That's why this which information is written like that. And again, you will get these um, coupled equations that you can solve. And then this is another example from my um, PhD student. Um, yeah, it's also a bit constructed, but um, so you assume that there's different diseases in the world. So these are heart and different lung diseases and that there are different treatments that are given by this utility function. And um, what you can then see is, for example, that so there's two different, say, populations. One where these diseases are equally probable and then another population where heart diseases are more prevalent. And, um, <clears throat> and then, so there's two different heart diseases, right? They're not the same. Um, and then in one case, you get basically uh, a situation where the experts, you'll have experts for heart disease and the two different lung diseases. But in the other population, you will basically get a different division of labor where you have basically one lung doctor and two different kind of experts for the two different heart diseases, right? And it makes more sense to specialize there and make more distinction because uh, in the example, it was assumed that there's two different heart diseases where you, if you distinguish them, you can get even more utility, right? Um, and so this is just some other stuff that we've been playing around with. So here in this example, we assumed uh, what happens if we now model these expert systems in such a way that um, each expert has a prior, and this prior would be uh, a generative neural network, a variational autoencoder in that case. So you can, if that doesn't mean anything to you, just imagine it's um, a very flexible distribution where you can sample from. And that then the world state comes in, you select one of these experts, and then there is a, the thinking process would be modeled by a Markov chain Monte Carlo, where you try to basically try out different possibilities to find the best, and you combine these two things, right? You learn these priors, and you combine it with this search process then to get to the posterior. Um, and you can then see, okay, if I have uh, multiple experts, then, um, and I have basically less thinking time, then I can do better, right? If you have infinite thinking time, one expert can do everything because you can optimize everything. If you have less thinking time, um, then it's better to have multiple experts that can basically already like do with a few search steps 
uh, find the optimum in their surrounding, right? But if you have just one expert that is there in the middle of the room, say, and has to find the optimum in anywhere in the room, then it would take lots of time, essentially. Um, yeah, this is another example we tried to ask, okay, what if we represent the posterior distribution again um, parametrically, so here with linear functions. So we'll, it's like different experiments that we did. So this is just stuff that's going on at the minute. Um, say, for example, you have a classification problem that is, cannot be linearly separated, but each expert is just a linear expert, right? So uh, no individual can solve this classification task. Can you put them together such that you can solve the problem, right? Or also regression. We want to regress this function. We just have a linear regressors, and then you have different experts that sort of try to uh, approximate this function. Um, and the last thing I can briefly mention is that now we're also looking at bigger networks, right? I just showed you things with three variables. Um, so you can ask now, okay, if I have a utility function over action and world state, and now I have many people, many experts, um, that can do different things, and each of them sort of uh, has a different limitation in how much information they can process. What is the optimal way to put these uh, people together to solve the problem, right? And you basically then you have to look over all the possible ways you can combine this. And we restricted ourselves here to basically um, just pure feed-forward information processing paths, right? And then in that case, you can decompose everything again with these free energies in more or less the same way that we discussed already. Um, and then you get basically graphs like this where the information goes from world state to action selection. Um, and you can choose between many different graphs. And then the difficulty is to you try these out for different utility functions, right? And then you have to sort of argue, okay, is there a common principle? What are good design principles, what are structures that appear very often that are successful in solving tasks. Um, um, yeah, this is the kind of stuff we're looking at at the minute. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my talk, just in time. Uh, and I hope that I've convinced you that bounded rationality is an interesting research topic, that the, the, this kind of free energy principle it's maybe also an interesting way to think about problems, to give a unified perspective, I guess, on many things that otherwise maybe look a bit disparate. Okay, that's it. Thanks.